So this afternoon we've got a double act today because the project being presented was a collaboration and the two presenters will be familiar faces to lots of you here. So we have Dr Carly Lightowlers, who's a senior lecturer in criminology at the University of Liverpool and her research makes use of administrative and secondary data sources to study alcohol related violence, how these, pro how these cases are processed through the courts and the unequal distribution of harm as well. And she's conducted research into violence uh, more broadly as well. We also have Dr. Lucy Bryant, who's a senior researcher with us at the Institute of Alcohol Studies. She's worked here for seven years. She's part-time at IAS, and the rest of the time, she's a lecturer in criminology at the Open University. Lucy's work focuses on alcohol's contribution to violence and also to inequalities as well. And she's recently completed a PhD in social policy at the LSE, which was exploring how live music is regulated in England and Wales and what that might tell us about contemporary policing, regulation and social control. So the project being presented this afternoon, um, a lot of the policy discussions of the contribution of alcohol to violence often focuses on nighttime economy spaces. So when we think about violence, the stereotype really is to think about kind of pubs and clubs. And along those lines, in recent decades, kind of interventions have also focused on those kinds of sites as well and the areas that they tend to be clustered in. But this can overlook violence which takes place in other sites, including at home, and also the ways that alcohol sold in places like supermarkets might contribute to violence as well. So this project um, used a novel approach to look at how off-trade alcohol availability contributes to violence and domestic violence. Now you'll hear more about that novel approach in a moment from Lucy and Carly, but this research really adds to existing calls for policymakers to consider places like supermarkets and shops in their violence prevention efforts. So the project was funded by the British Academy in partnership with the Leverhulme Trust. And if you'd like to read more after this presentation, there's an IAS report, which we published a couple of weeks ago um, about this research. And we can post a link to that in the chat box um, during the talk. So Lucy and Carly are gonna speak for about 25 minutes. Lucy's gonna speak first, then it's gonna go to Carly and then back to Lucy again. Um, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions after their talk. So questions in the chat as you're, as you're thinking of things during the talk, if you can. So I'll hand over to Lucy and Carly now to tell you about their work on violence and the off trade. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you so much for coming today. We're really excited to share the findings of this work with you all. As Sadie mentioned, this was funded by the British Academy with the Leverhulme Trust, and we were very grateful for that support. Uh, and what we're gonna be presenting today are, are findings from this piece of work that used the closures which took place during uh, the COVID-19 period, the closures of pubs and clubs, um, as a way to kind of assess the, the, the role of off-trade alcohol availability and its, its contribution to violence. Uh, so as a way of some background, um, there, there's strong evidence of an association between alcohol availability and violence. Um, so what do I mean when I say that? Uh, we know alcohol can contribute to incidents of violence and work which has taken place across many different settings and which has used a variety of different designs uh, has shown that as, um, as opportunities to purchase alcohol increase in time and in space, that the level um, of violence in that area can increase also. Uh, there are two broad types of alcohol availability. One um, is on-trade availability. So that is sites like bars, restaurants, um, clubs, uh, where alcohol is purchased for consumption on the premises, hence the on-trade. Um, and the second is uh, off-trade premises. Um, so off-trade availability covers things like shops and supermarkets where alcohol is purchased to be taken away um, and consumed somewhere else. Uh, it's important that we distinguish between these two kinds of availability because we would theorize that 
These might contribute to violence in different ways through different mechanisms. So for example, if you think about on-trade settings, um, they uh, involve different groups of people with different relationships to each other than, than incidents in the home. Um, and they might be kind of in constellation with other premises in like a nighttime economy space. So we might think that these kinds of availability will impact on violence differently. So it's worthwhile investigating those kind of separately. However, having said that, it can be difficult to disentangle their effects. So there's a number of reasons for this. One being the way that those kinds of availability are entangled with one another in kind of everyday life. So we might think about something like preloading. So this is where somebody might purchase alcohol in the off trade to consume at home before they head into the on trade um, and to, to drink and purchase alcohol in pubs and bars. Um, so it's very difficult to kind of disentangle those two kinds of availability and how they might have contributed to any kind of violence that might take place. The opposite is also true. Somebody might purchase alcohol in the on trade and then head home and continue drinking alcohol that they had purchased from supermarkets. So it's, it's, it's quite difficult. Uh, another barrier we come up against, which is particularly relevant for um, investigating the off trade, is this need to account for the spatial range of individuals' lives, which, which Holmes et al. Have, have raised before. So this is the idea that uh, where research has attempted to um, assess the relationship between off-trade or on-trade availability and violence, if they've done so by looking at a premise and trying to connect it kind of in space to violent incidents that take place nearby, um, that, can, that can be tricky, but it can be even trickier for off-trade premises. This is because, like I mentioned, if, if we're purchasing alcohol from an on-trade site, we're consuming it there, and we might expect any violence it contributes to take place in and around that site, at least at least some of the violence. Um, on the other hand, if we're thinking about off-trade purchases, somebody might purchase alcohol, say, on their way home from work in one location, head to their home or head to another social occasion, like a friend's house or something. So it can be very kind of spatially divorced from, from its effects. Um, so that makes things kind of tricky. At the same time, we also have new developments like online delivery and, you know, supermarket orders and things like that, that, that complicate that kind of spatial relationship even further. So it, it just makes assessing these things difficult sometimes. Um, beyond this, we also um, have seen that while a lot of work has looked at alcohol's availability and its impact on violence, not all this work disaggregates domestic violence. And if we were thinking about off-trade sales, particularly that the alcohol might be consumed in the home, that might be quite a important gap that we want to address. So given this, um, Carly and I were very interested um, when we started considering the, um, the implications of the restrictions around um, bars and pubs and nightclubs that were introduced through the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, essentially, we realised there were periods of time in England when all of the availability in the country would be considered off-trade availability. Uh, so we looked to use the scenario to investigate the impact of off-trade availability on violence. Uh, so we had two um, research questions, which I'm showing on the screen for you now. One, looking at the overall levels of violence, which has been flagged as alcohol related. And the other, looking at the proportion of violence that was flagged as alcohol related. And as mentioned, we conducted this investigation looking at first violence overall and then domestic violence specifically. Uh, we used data from police. So this uh, captured the amount and the proportion of violent incidents that were flagged as alcohol related. 
Uh, we had that data by police force and by month for the year preceding the pandemic, the pandemic year and the year after. Um, and in this analysis, um, based on lots of considerations like the differences in the restrictions that took that were in place between England and Wales and some implications of the data we had access to, we ended up including 35 police force areas in the final analysis. Uh, we calculated um, uh, a measure of unlicensed um, availability um, based on the dates for which um, those kind of sites were legally permitted to trade. So essentially, we looked at months and we worked out how many days in each month were uh, on trade sites um, closed or um, were closed based on the restrictions that were in place. Um, and when we uh, looked at kind of the breakdown of all the months, it was essentially um, a, a very kind of binary relationship in that most months were either entirely closed or entirely open. Um, so we took the approach that if any days uh, trading in that month was closed, we class the month as closed. But we also conducted some sensitivity analyses um, to check our approach with kind of softer thresholds. And we can talk more about that in Q&A if that is of interest. So I'll hand over to Carly now to talk us through more of the method. Thank you, Lucy. Yeah, and big thank you to the people at the Home Office as well that provided us with those police data for further analysis. Um, so we uh, um, we explored the data, um, first of all, quite, quite basically using uh, descriptive statistics and simple um, kind of statistical tests just to look at whether levels of violence and levels of so levels of alcohol related violence and levels of alcohol related domestic violence varied in the pre pandemic year to the the main pandemic year and, and the post pandemic period. Um, and we also reran those tests, having coded those periods, those months into whether or not the um, on trade was operating um, or not, just to look at whether levels varied um, when premises had been closed um, versus open. Um, we then also kind of ran some um, more sophisticated models. Um, these were, for those that are interested, that longitudinal um, growth curve model, models, and they allowed us to model the proportion of alcohol-related violence for any given month um, within a police force area. So effectively, we were taking um, account of the fact that different areas would have a different base level um, of violence anyway, um, and that changes within those forces might look different. Um, and then we were able to introduce um, a, a variable accounting for um, the given month and whether or not the um, the on-trade premises were in operation that month or not to look at any changes. So if we move on to the next slide, I could reveal firstly um, that when we looked at um, periods of um, open versus closed, um, when, when licensed premises were open versus closed, we saw that on average, you know, levels of alcohol related violence were higher. So there's there's no major surprise there. That might be what we expect uh, expected to hear. Um, and what we found from our modeling was also that when we looked at the proportion of that violence that was alcohol related, um, it did reduce in periods that when premises on licensed premises were closed, it reduced by three percentage points. So that was a reduction from 15.5% down to 12.5, 12.8%, uh, 12 sorry. Uh, on average, this worked out to be around about 89 fewer alcohol-related incidents a month per police force area on average. Um, so this was a reduction, but it's perhaps not as large a reduction as we might have expected, um, given what we heard before from both Sadie and Lucy, given the kind of the, the way in which the um, nighttime economy and, and, and on, on trade are discussed when it comes to violence, uh, their contribution to it, and the crime prevention efforts that seem to be centred on those contexts. I think what um, makes, you know, I find is additionally interesting is the fact that 
although we saw a reduction in the in the overall level of violence, when we then passed out our findings and looked specifically at alcohol-related domestic violence, we actually observed no change um, in levels of alcohol-related violence um, during periods in which the on-licensed um, premises were, were open versus closed. Um, so that those on-trade closures didn't significantly impact on the proportion of domestic violence that was alcohol-related. And that kind of, again, points to this fact that there seems to be, um, you know, a, a, a still a significant proportion of alcohol-related uh, domestic violence that are going on that might not necessarily be attributable to um, unlicensed premises in the whole anyway. Thanks. Um, of course, um, we want to caveat our, our, our research sensibly. Um, there's um, the fact that we've used police data first and foremost so that's worthy of mention. I mean, police data by its uh, very nature will only ever be um, the crimes and the, the incidents of violence that the police know about. So somebody has either alerted to them or they have uh, found out about these through other means. So, of course, there will be a level of under-recording, um, which, uh, which is a known factor and, and, and especially known perhaps amongst those victims of domestic violence. So we suggest that our findings are of underestimates of, of, of the prevalence of violence throughout this period in any case. Um, and, and those limitations are well known, but they do allow us to examine those fluctuations over time. And of course, the time period that we've been able to examine here is, is, is a, a very unique three year window, which we're hoping to, to make, make use of in this context. But of course, it would be interesting to see what happens longer term post pandemic after people's drinking patterns have shifted and behavioral patterns have shifted. We might see different profiles of alcohol related violence. Um, you know, uh, moving forward. So we'd like to see kind of longer term follow up and monitoring of those trends, ideally. And I think um, in terms of the way we've kind of exploited this unique um, unique social, social uh, period of our lives during the pandemic to kind of look at periods um, where on trade premises were completely closed. We do acknowledge that we that, that this doesn't necessarily represent you know normal times for everybody. Um, the pandemic, of course, disrupted our social, economic, and emotional lives during this period in ways that could also be impacting upon trends uh, in violence and indeed trends in alcohol consumption, which we know kind of moved more into the home and things like that. So we're not suggesting that our our fi findings kind of perfectly quantify um, and assess, um, you know, what would have been the case had we simply kind of removed alcohol, uh, unlicensed alcohol availability in normal times. We are aware that that, um, you know, is a bit more messy in reality. Yeah, thank you, Carly. Um, so reflecting on those findings and kind of keeping those limitations in mind as well, um, this, is, this is how we've kind of concluded this work. So as Carly mentioned, the, the falls we saw in the levels of violence that was recorded as alcohol related um, were to be expected. And they kind of, they make sense um, in terms of the, the literature that's kind of preceded this work. Um, that when we closed pubs, bars, uh, restaurants and nightclubs, that, that represented a notable decrease in the physical availability of alcohol across England. Um, so we we weren't surprised when we saw when we saw that that fall in in kind of the overall level. Uh, it was very interesting though that we didn't see a fall in the in the same statistic for for domestic violence. Um, alongside that though, what was really interesting to us, um, as Carly mentioned previously, is that this proportion of violence that was recorded as alcohol related really altered only subtly and for alcohol related domestic violence um that proportion didn't didn't fall at all so the proportion of violence that was domestic violence that was recorded as alcohol related didn't didn't fall and what that suggested to us um was that even given the the limitation we mentioned before of, of this being a very unusual time and there perhaps being other drivers that we would not have been able to kind of account for or control for in work like this. Um, even taking this finding at kind of the broadest level, 
um, we feel able to say that it appears off-trade alcohol availability plays a role in the level of violence um, and that this role might be comparable to that of on-trade availability. That kind of um, any kind of assumption that alcohol sold in the on-trade is a, a more significant driver of violence compared to alcohol sold in the in the off trade would kind of be faulty, I suppose. Um, what we take from this really is that um, any attempts to address um, alcohol's kind of contribute to violence contribution to violence can't solely con consider these on trade settings. The violence is definitely more publicly kind of visible in those sites, but that interventions need to think about both kinds of availability and what what does um you know the kind of what does the alcohol market look like including supermarkets and shops um and that is especially true um for any intervention that's thinking about alcohol's contribution to domestic violence um so thank you so much for listening and we'll be really keen to take any questions you have? My question is, like, um, like, why do people, right, like with alcohol violence, to harm people in the world? Like, why do they come with alcohol, like driving? And they harm in the world. How can we stop that before harming people? Yeah, so I suppose um, any kind of incident of, of violence that's being kind of flagged as alcohol related is obviously um, there's kind of complex causes behind any one of those incidents of violence. And alcohol is kind of one factor in, in any of those incidents. So I uh, I feel it would be it would be difficult for for me anyway to answer um, kind of uh, different scenarios call for kind of different interventions and things like that. Um, but thinking purely about the the role of alcohol in any in any given incident, I think um, one thing we thought about a lot um, following this work were, was around the availability of alcohol and how. Um, how how are kind of people currently set up to um to think about that in their own local area um in england and wales um the licensing system um it 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 allows people to um generally contest um a single application that comes in um based on the application that single application's merit so there's not necessarily kind of the presumption that we'd be able to think about whole areas or um anything uh, uh, anything kind of about the the broader environment in which an application was coming into um i think that would be a really useful first step um but i don't know if carly has any further thoughts around these these kind of ideas well, I liked the question for broadening it back out because I think there's been a quite a narrow focus on what crime, you know, violence prevention in the nighttime economy and around alcohol related violence looks like. And I don't think we've properly explored the potential for population level um, measures to kind of mitigate some of the kind of harm in the form of crime and violence. I know some of the minimum unit pricing stuff has, has tried to do that, but you know, I think there is more merit to sort of thinking. Uh, upstream rather than downstream because it tends to be kind of a criminal justice approach as opposed to a public health approach. Thanks very much Lucy and Carly, hopefully that answers um, your question. I have another question. Uh, how many uh, how many are in the world that relate to the finance? Like what is the amount of alcohol in the world and how many people are affected in the world? Numbers in the world. Okay, thank you. Um, does any, do you know off the top of your head to answer that question? Because obviously this research was focused just on England, so I don't want to put you on the spot with no, no answer I'd to say that. Uh, Maybe. Worldwide, I'm not sure, but um, we know that about um, 
Is it two in every five yeah. violent crimes in England are thought to be alcohol related? Thank you. Um, we're going to come to Laura Harvey from Alcohol Chains, and then we're going to go in the chat to Maristella, then Jen. So, Laura, over to you. Thank you, and thanks so much for the presentation. It was really interesting, and what what a fascinating thing to be able to look at that with all the, the premises being closed. My question is about the types of violence. I wondered whether the data showed was there were there different types of violent crimes um, that were being committed um, in those different time periods. Yes, yeah, so we had overall um, numbers of violence each month per police force area, um, and they had helpfully given us an indicator, which is far from perfect, I might add, <laughs> as to whether those were um, identified as alcohol related, um, as well as those that were flagged as domestic violence um, related crimes. We did have further disaggregation as to the kind of usually in sort of home office categories, whether it was like um, manslaughter, you know, homicides, whether it was um, assaults or, you know, assaults with injury, that sort of that sort of breakdown. We didn't go into that level of granularity in this analysis, I have to admit, because we were mainly interested in just passing out those that were happening in, in the public versus private context, so the home versus the public context at this level, we would fall into some problems of probably low numbers with the more extreme forms of violence if 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 we did that um, as well. And um, so we we took the pragmatic decision to keep them aggregated on this occasion. I think as well, it will be so interesting. Um, Carly and I weren't able to use crime survey figures for this work because. Um, in the by when we were completing the the study, they hadn't been released yet for the COVID nineteen period, um, and I think as we kind of touched upon, um, police recorded data has this kind of wide offence coverage, but we 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 know that there are incidents that aren't being captured by that, and it I think it's reasonable to suspect that public violence is probably better captured. Um, than violence in the home because that would that would require reporting and we know there's all sorts of reasons why people aren't necessarily happy to do that um, so I think it it would be it would probably be really because I think your question's a really interesting one and I think the crime survey data would probably be the place to have a have a further look into that as well based on yeah the kind of what, yeah, what we can tell and what we kind of know about this data source. So yeah, thanks so much. Thank you. People are very interested in, in data stuff on this. So we've got a question from Maristella, Maristella's iPhone. Um, are you there Maristella? Would you like to unmute and ask, ask the question yourself or I can read it out if you're not able to. I'll read it out. The question was, would it be feasible? Is that no, can't now. Okay, I'll read it out. Um, would it be feasible to require or do some sort of research project with the police, um, seeing about how well they can record, record information on the last place of alcohol purchase and the last place of drinking in the places in cases of violence? So I read that out a little badly. Um, any thoughts on that? Challenges, opportunities. That's really yeah. Interesting. Yeah, really interesting idea because I know that that's what has been tried to be introduced in like hospitals and A and E admissions that they try and record um, the last place of, of 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 drinking, and I think that would be really valuable information. Um, and I would be very up for you trying to convince the police to record that information. I think that'd be really useful. Um, at the moment, they they don't routinely. Um, they have um, what is now considered to be a kind of mandatory, in inverted commas, um, uh, um, flag on their database whereby they can indicate whether or not they believe the incident to be alcohol related. But of course, um, that in itself is sort of a bit of a subjective assessment and also relies on the officer at the scene to 
actively do proactively record it as such so we again have explored elsewhere why we think that might also be a bit of an underestimate just because of the demands on police when they're attending these these things and the volume of kind of um recording um that they have to do um their end of course uh, it's, it's all very nice to ask them to do these things sometimes it's really difficult to get everybody to comply with these things but i think a small scale study you know where you actually kind of asked officers to include that or to reflect on that i'm sure they have their own insider knowledge on, on attending these kinds of incidents i'm sure they could give you a, a, an assessment that way as well i feel also as though um it might be um, really useful um, to do some more qualitative work around this because a lot of a lot of violence work does think about um, it does kind of like respond to the data that's available in terms of the police and things like that. But actually, as we mentioned, there's so many incidents of violence that don't necessarily ever reach the police or might not ever be captured in a crime survey. And given the kind of like entanglement that can go on between the on and the off trade, like if we were canvassing people kind of in nighttime economy settings, their last place of purchase might be a pub, but their their whole day might have kind of begun earlier with other alcohol purchased in, in, in supermarkets, or they might be on their way home and they're going to purchase something on their way home. So I think actually um, maybe interviewing people in, 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 either you know in the nighttime economy or who have kind of previously maybe reported to the police or the crime survey to find out more about like what does that whole whole day look like that could be really interesting as well always good to get lots of ideas for further work um peers can see you waiting patiently there i've got a question another data question that's coming directly to me from jem so we're going to do that one first and then we'll come to you after that if that's okay so jem are you there to ask your data question yeah, I mean, they've kind of touched on it a couple of times, uh, Lucy and Carly. Um, and I also apologise for asking the question. I feel like IAS uh, personnel shouldn't be allowed to, but <laughs> I want to know the answer. Um, and it's, yeah, again, a, a bit of a broader question and about the accuracy of the police recorded data um, and whether we know loosely what the accuracy is, because I just imagine that there are a huge number of incidents that um, are never recorded at all or never reported, sorry, and therefore won't be part of these um, these data sets. And I also wondered a sort of follow on question about um, the fact that there's, I assume, um, certain demographics who are quite unlikely to or less likely to report um, certain incidents because of perceived or real discrimination they face from the police. Um, and I wonder if that will therefore also impact the data sets and therefore any sort of um, uh, analyses we can we can garner from them. I don't know who wants to go first, Lucy or me. You <laughs> um, go, Yeah, it's a really interesting question. So we don't know the extent to which the proportion of alcohol related violence is under captured. So we don't know exactly what we're missing. Um, but we do know that it is you know, it has in the past been really poorly recorded, so officers haven't necessarily been using that ability to indicate a, a violent crime as alcohol related. Um, and I think it would definitely disproportionately affect some populations more so than others, more deprived communities, different ethnic groups, abs you know, absolutely. I think, again, officers may be more inclined to perhaps capture things as alcohol related as well if they are doing nighttime economy district patrols because it seems like a more routine thing that they might kind of just be used to ticking um as they as they kind of make their way through um you know the, the, the data capture their end um so there are lots of different things going on which is why we do think that these are not especially perfect data and um, the only positive <laughs> that i can take from that is that we suspect that that is meaning that our results not only are they you know that they would be more likely to capture nighttime economy violence than perhaps violence in the home and yet we still see a significant proportion of domestic violence being flagged as such which is really interesting and i think noteworthy um in its own right but that also you know what we're suggesting is we might have underestimates in the scale of the problem um could be larger uh, and could affect certain populations more so than others not least because domestic violence perhaps affects more women and girls potentially for example and that's why i think those sort of population level 
interventions or different types of interventions that don't center on the nighttime economy be particularly helpful because they might actually help uh, redress inequalities in victimization, which I know we've seen in some of the other work we've we've done, Lucy. I don't think you want to speak to that. Yeah, I think, yeah, it's a really interesting crossover in work Carly and I have done previously in this work because we've looked at um, rates of victimization uh, for different kinds of alcohol-related violence um, by different socioeconomic groups, and we found those um, in lower socioeconomic groups experience uh, alcohol-related violence and particularly alcohol-related domestic violence at much higher rates. And we've kind of theorised some of that is likely to be connected to uh, kind of like the resources it might take to um, leave those situations, uh, but also the fact that we know the availability of alcohol is higher in lower SES neighbourhoods. So it kind of all feeds in together. And Carly's done work before that showed alcohol's availability kind of um, supercharged the effects of deprivation um, when it came to the um, incidence of, of violence and, and the kind of the rates of violence in those areas. Um, so yeah, in summary. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, both coming to Piers now, and then there's a question from Mick in the chat that we'll come to after that. Thanks, Piers. Thanks, Sadie. Um, I wish my question was a bit better formed in my head, but I'm just going to say it out loud a bit. So yeah, I guess, you know, so I'm from NACOA and, uh, you know, research study we did ages ago and, and, and studies since then have shown that uh, children in a house who uh, where alcohol is a problem, they they often witness domestic violence in, uh, in, in, in multiples more instances than people who don't have alcohol problems in the household. And I guess I was just interested, especially, I guess, in, in terms of the data as well, um, about whether or not there's any recording in terms of uh, the, uh, the the instances of violence in the, of the home and then whether or not children are kind of, how many of those homes do have children in, there, in them? And, and then I guess the tag on to that is about whether or not anybody's actually doing anything. I suspect not. And um, so, yeah, so that, I guess that's my first question is sort of broad about, is anybody thinking about kind of um, the effects of children of, of violence in the, in the house right, right now? Um, where alcohol is a problem. But, and then I guess to a certain extent, it sort of leads me then to think about some conversation earlier about the differences between pubs and off licenses and to what extent, you know, that pub culture at least had a culture with it and there was, it might sort of self police, even if it's not policed formally in the sense of, you know, intervention from somebody knocking down the door. And whether or not, I guess, off, off drink, off trade drinking is more isolating, I guess it is by nature, than pub drinking or public drinking. And, and therefore, whether or not there are additional challenges. Sorry, I'm giving you more, too, too many things here. But then I suppose to what extent that there's sort of a challenge, especially when you're coming to sort of impacts on family and children and kind of secondary harm around the fact that potentially people are drinking more at home and, and that off, off license drinking is more isolating. It's much harder. There's many more barriers then for people being able to find help. Yeah, I have some thoughts definitely on the second part that have come straight to mind. Um, I think some of what you're speaking to definitely um, kind of gets towards that idea of there being different, different mechanisms for the way alcohol might contribute to violence in, in different settings. Um, and I think it's, I think it's definitely worth recognising kind of the changes in in the alcohol market. I mean, you were mentioning um, pubs and off licenses, but I often also think about supermarkets and what, you know, maybe is quite a stark change in the availability of alcohol and the accessibility of alcohol in like recent decades. And I think supermarkets um, are kind of not always in the conversation um, because obviously like they, 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 you know, they serve us for so much, more um we buy our food there and things but um i think that they're, they're an important part of this conversation also um and um i think um in terms of the point you made about um data on children i in terms of the kind of data carly and i've been using um that's not the sort of thing that's captured 
not kind of in I don't know about sort of free text fields that come with police records um but not in the kind of like the the kind of um incident level data you'd get in like a data set like this um but you're certainly right about um the home and kind of this is what I think we've thought about quite a bit in terms of when you're thinking about the kind of interventions that can reach people in their homes, um, if kind of our go-to is always criminal justice, um, there's kind of a, a fault line there because that would that requires people to kind of report or be identified. And um, that's like you say, situations that are occurring in the home is it's that's just kind of public violence in the nighttime economy is so much more visible. And I think that's definitely a consideration, you know, when whenever we're thinking about this kind of violence, should we always be thinking about this in kind of like the criminal justice realm? Or do we need to think, you know, as has been mentioned previously, um, about other kind of interventions, like what can we do with licensing? Um, what's kind of the environment that 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 consumption and, and the violence is taking place in. That was a bit of a rambly answer, but I hope that was helpful. Yeah, that's really, really fascinating. Thank you. Carly, did you want to come in on, on that one and the kind of menu of options from, of uh, mm -hmm. questions from peers or are you, are you good um, at this point? Yeah, I I'm, I'm all right. I thought it was, I thought it was an interesting set of considerations and I think it would be really interesting, I think, touches on what one of the other questions probed us about as well as about the sort of distribution beyond just these kind of broad level ups downs monthly figures you know who's you know what's the age profile of victims what's the age profile of the perpetrators in these incidents what the extent to which you can disaggregate them as well and um, in that way because um for so long kind of the narrative around you know the turn of the century was around young people binge drinking nighttime economy and of course with that visibility it was very easy for the police to kind of be seen to be doing something in those spaces and I think there's still perhaps a little bit of a reticence to acknowledge um, that the problem might not be you know young people uh, in the in the domestic setting but that the, the, the harm might be um against young people I think it's just really difficult I think for the police to kind of be able to you know think about how they might operate with some of those sort of more thorny issues that it's just you know it's happening behind closed doors whereas if it's happening in the nighttime economy it's kind of easier for them to intervene thank you okay brilliant um we've got um two comments in the chat we've got one point from Mick trustee alcohol change around difficulties um, measuring this, which I'm sure you both um, empathise with. Mike, Mick, sorry, Mick, not Mike. Do you want to come off and come on and um, speak to this point? I'm not sure if you're still there. Yeah, I'm sorry, thanks. I'll yes. Problems with the camera, so I'll just stay on mute. No, I mean, I'm a, I'm a retired cop for 30 years, so I can fully simplify with uh, Carly and Lucy's issues around the, the data collection, I had the same problem when I was working as um, a home reduction officer in the force. Um, I think it, it's, it's one of those where, from a policing point of view, uh, they deal with what's in front of them. Um, and very generally, so we, we talked about that, you talked about the question around asking where your last drink was or where your last bought your last drink. Um, it's not something I asked, which is asked, which is a, Weird because when it comes to drugs and someone's been arrested for drug possession, that's one of the first questions you ask them. Um, where did you buy your drugs from? Um, so we don't they don't tend to do it for for the alcohol side of things, um, which is something that for many years um, a few of us tried to to get that. And the other side of it is there's there's, there's no standard way of recording across all forces. Um, I noticed there was only thirty odd forces that obviously responded to the data collection when actually you've got 44 English forces or English and well, certainly English and Welsh forces to, to look from. So it, it's it's difficult to get a consistent data set when you're looking at across policing. Um doesn't diminish the work that's being done. I think it's really interesting. Um, but certainly, yeah, it was more of a comment in the, the chat around the policing side of things. Thank you. Yeah, you, 
in fact it's it's in, if you touch on a point that in fact Lucy and I have a forthcoming book chapter on and we're talking about kind of how you're able to to measure alcohol related violence and, and we look at different data filters but one in other police and of course although there have been efforts to kind of standardize it or um the data capture around alcohol related incidents and there have been kind of mandates given that you know the home office suggests that they should be flagged if it's victim or the offender has been perceived um, to be under the effects of alcohol consumption. But clearly there are many subjective interpretations and judgments that go on, you know, on, a, on an officer event level that lead to that perhaps being flagged, perhaps not. And um, so there's a lot of still kind of uncertainty about those, those estimates. So yeah, thank you for pointing out some of the realities as well of dealing with those things. Um, From... Yeah. Um... Sorry, Carly. Yeah, From yeah, challenges yeah. to an example of good practice, um, Jay Byram, don't know your first name, sorry, but um, we've got an example from San Diego County. Um, Jay Byram, are you there? Hi. Um, did you want to share any information around, around this point and how it's used, this good well, example we, that we're talking about? Sure. We do it for driving under the influence. Uh, and it's not law enforcement. But what it is, is when someone is arrested for driving under the influence, they have to go to a uh, DUI class. And so it's asked there. And then we, we gather the information. Um, you might be able, you know, I don't know if when someone's reported as domestic violence, if they... Uh, they have to go to a some kind of training or or uh, uh, counseling something that they could ask the question there. What you know about alcohol and uh, you might get some numbers from them. I mean, it's not perfect for our DUI, but we get a lot of information about bars and uh, if there's three or more from one bar, uh, we go and visit them uh, and talk to them about their alcohol service uh, and try to change the atmosphere in the bar. Well, that's really, that's really interesting. Yeah, as I say, those aren't part of the routine data that we might have been able to access on this occasion, but really useful. And I do know that obviously people that are seeing probation services will be asked about their their drinking i don't think they asked you know, where they may have consumed or purchased the last drink before the offense but they obviously screen them for their kind of wider needs around alcohol i think that's um it's really interesting as well because some of this kind of conversation around it being tricky to capture these kind of incidents in in police stats um also kind of hints at something that was just shared about going to going to the the retailers and talking with them is that part of the reason these incidents probably aren't all being captured um gives us a hint about how we should be trying to resolve them because there it's there there's kind of a part of this puzzle that often gets kind of left out of the conversation and it is the retailers and it's when we have, you know, uh, the kind of current structure of the licensing system, I would feel does kind of favour the retailers. Um, and like I've said, it's if we are kind of, if new licences are approved for a nighttime economy space, because of the kind of space that is, any violence that that contributes to becomes very visible and uh, people in the area and, uh, you know, other responsible authorities would be able to kind of respond to that through the licensing system. But the kind of violence that might not cap get captured in police recorded statistics that might take place in the home, that might be, you know, repeated, that alcohol is kind of involved and is, is part of, um, we wouldn't be able to see that after kind of new supermarket or shop licenses are, are granted. And um, I just think that's really worth considering when, when we're thinking about, yeah, the retailers are kind of part of this availability puzzle, really. 
Thanks very much for those reflections. Um, we're coming up to time, but just on the children and families um, side of things, Sheila from Alco Action Ireland has um, shared a link to Operation Encompass, which I've not heard of before. Sheila, do you want to say a thing or two about it if you're still there? Yes, sure. Uh, ha happy to do that. Um, firstly, thanks so much. That was a great um, presentation. So Operation Encompass is um, a police-led um, programme, which is an operation in, I think, about 43 of the police uh, jurisdictions or, or the, the police forces in England and Wales. It has recently actually been introduced to Northern Ireland as, as well. So um, essentially schools would sign up to the programme and uh, and then, as I say, if the police would attend a family home where there has been an incident and there's a child in the ho in the home, they would by, by eight o'clock, actually, the following morning or even seven o'clock the following morning, they would have made a report to the school to say there's a child who's been impacted by domestic violence or has witnessed it or has, you know, been, been in, in some way in, involved so that the school are aware when a child comes in, you know, of, of the, you know, of a traumatic situation that has obviously happened and the idea is that they're met with a bit of support a bit of, a bit of kindness now it's uh, that that's a very brief explanation of it and there is a whole training program that would go um around it but it's an early intervention thing and i, I just you, you know i was very very struck by Piers' uh, comments earlier on what's actually in place for children and that's just something that that is a useful thing so you may be in a in a you might be able to spread the word about it so the schools would sign up for it uh, as as well because the school have to be they, they have to be um part of it before the the police would actually contact them thanks very much for sharing that um my right in assuming you don't need to come back on that point we're just up to time brilliant thanks so much for sharing that and thank you everybody for your time attention this afternoon and contributions on data sources and different ideas and other programs and things like that that's really really brilliant um the re this research is already published we've shared a link to it you can find it on the ias website so thanks very much everybody for joining us this afternoon thanks very much to lucy and carly for excellent presentation and we'll see you mm -hmm. again soon for future webinar thank you